Egypt, that she would move over Iraq, that she would move over Syria. We ask for a mighty move of God over Istanbul, Turkey. Lord, we ask God that you would pour out your glory. And Lord, I pray as they're fasting, Lord Jesus, may you come to them and reveal yourself to them, Lord. Lord, we thank you this day that you not only love the sons of Isaac, but you also love the sons of Ishmael. So, Lord Jesus, we just bless your name today. And we cry out, holy, holy, holy. And, Lord God Almighty, I ask for an anointing over the word today that's going to break every yoke. Lord, I thank you the anointing makes a way. And there's an anointing that breaks the yoke. And Lord, I ask right now that even as you're decreeing and declaring new beginnings over this house, even as you're declaring expansion and increase, and the enemy is trying to push back, Lord Jesus, from the courts of heaven, we cry out to you, and we say to you this day, Lord Jesus, let it be unto us according to thy word. The gates of hell will not prevail against that that you've established, Lord. And you've established your church. Yeah. Lord, you've established this church. Yeah. And Lord, we are yours and you are ours. So Lord Jesus, this day we decree and declare you are our first love. And Lord, we're returning back to the things that we once did. Lord, give us a fiery passion for you. Yeah. And Lord Jesus, we pray these things in your precious name. And Lord, I thank you right now. You're calling us to die. So that you can live through us. Yes. Lord Jesus, I don't think in the Western church we understand how to die. But Lord, nonetheless, Paul cried out, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Yes. Lord Jesus, help us to die so that you might live. Lord, may who we were die this morning, and may who we are in you begin to live. Amen. Lord, I thank you for Catherine Coleman who would say that Catherine Coleman has died. She no longer exists. This is the new person that God created me to be. Lord, she drew a line in the sand, and she said everything behind this line is covered in the blood, and everything that lies ahead for me is covered in the blood, and I'm no longer who I was. And Lord, as she stepped forth in faith in that word, Lord, the latter, whoo, the latter glory was so much greater than the former glory in her life. And Lord Jesus, I ask today that we would do that same thing. Yes. Yeah. May we do that same thing. Yes. Holy Spirit, teach us how to die so that Christ might live. Yes. Holy Spirit, we not only want relationship with Jesus, but we want relationship with you. Lord, in the Baptist church, we used to sing an old song, I come to the garden alone yeah. while the dew is still on the roses. And Lord, I thank you that when we came into the chorus of that song, we would sing, And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Lord Jesus, we want to tarry with you today. Lord, anoint communion that we're going to take here later today. Lord, I ask this day that you would bless the bread that we're going to partake of, Lord, that represents your body. Lord, bless the cup that we're about to partake of. Lord, anoint it to bring deliverance and healing today. Lord, we honor you in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. For Lord, there's no other name under heaven given to men by which they can be saved but the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. 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 How many are in love with Jesus this morning? Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm so glad you're here this morning. And I'm thankful for our virtual family that's tuning in right now. Hallelujah. We are glad that you are in the house this morning. And uh, how many enjoyed praise and worship this morning? Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. 
You know, I rarely ever tell Pastor Cindy what the message is going to be on a Sunday morning. Unless God just gives me something, I'm bursting at the seams and I just got to let her know. So I didn't let her know what, uh, what we were going to be talking about this morning. But it lined up beautifully with the theme that God gave her this morning. Because we sang a lot of songs about Jesus being the Lamb. And this morning, we're going to talk about the beauty of the Passover. And if you know me, you know that I rarely ever preach a sermon based upon the season that we're in as far as an observance. I always just preach what the Lord gives me. But it's interesting is we're on the eve of Holy Week. Hallelujah. The Lord was talking to me yesterday about Passover. And the Lord said, I want you to preach on Passover today. So how many are ready to receive this morning? But I want to encourage you not to look at this as, oh, here we go. We're just going to talk about Passover again. I want us to see the beauty of the Passover and get a prophetic understanding of what God is talking about. Because I really believe that as the church, we are passing over into a new season right now. And that's really what Passover is about. It's about passing over what has been and stepping into something new in the Lord. How many received that this morning? Hallelujah. So I want you just to get ready to receive in the Lord. And Lord Jesus, I just ask this day, may you give us eyes that see and ears that hear. What the Spirit of God is saying to the church. Lord, last Sunday night at Pelly Road, you were talking about the fact that you want to open up our spiritual eyes. You want to open up our spiritual ears. You want to open up, Lord God, the eyes of our hearts. You want us to be able to smell into the realm of the Spirit, to taste the realm of the Spirit, to touch the realm of the Spirit. And Lord, I thank you there's more senses in the realm of the supernatural than there are in the natural. And I decree and declare this day, Lord Jesus, you're setting us free from dependence on our natural senses to be able to navigate. And I declare you're supernaturally activating our spiritual senses, our supernatural senses, because the unseen realm is more real than the seen realm. And I decree and declare, Lord, you're taking us into the realm of the unseen. But what is unseen will soon be seen. Lord, you're tearing the veil. You're removing the curtain. And the things that you've decreed and declared from your throne are coming forth in the realm of the natural. In Jesus' name. Lord Jesus, I ask now that you would send your angels into this room. Lord, are not your angels messengers of fire sent from your throne? Lord Jesus, may you release your angels in this room right now to release mantles, to release anointing, to release an activation over the church. Lord, may your angels flood into this building led by Michael to release a warrior anointing over your people, to awaken your warrior bride from slumber. Lord, to bring us forth into a deeper place of marriage with you. Holy Spirit, now I pray, may you just take this time over in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I want to encourage you to listen very closely to what the Lord is saying this morning. Because what the Lord is saying this morning is very strategic for us. Yesterday in the secret place, I kept hearing the Spirit of the Lord say, Strategy, 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 strategic, strategic, strategic. That's telling me that the Lord wants his people to come out of a place of not knowing and into a place of knowing. He's calling us out of a place of lack of understanding and into a place of understanding. Because how many know the prophet Hosea said, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. And how many know that knowledge is knowing? It's knowing. And the Lord says, in this season, I'm going to bring my people forth into a spirit of divine strategy. And the strategy is from my throne. And the Lord says, as I release that divine strategy, they're going to know what was once unknown. I am releasing to my people the treasures hidden in darkness. Strategy for the end of the age that they're going to need to navigate the things that are coming. And the Lord says that I will give you strategy before the enemy can even bring his plan forth. The Lord says even as he's forging the weapon at the anvil, before he can strike it with the hammer for the last time to release it against my people, 
I will already have given them divine strategy and through that strategy they will come before me in the courtrooms of the third heaven and they will nullify his weapons. They will destroy his strategy. They will tear down his strongholds. They will foil his plans before he can ever get his weapon off the anvil. So the Lord says, I'm calling my people into a place of divine strategy. So Holy Spirit, I ask that you would release the Issachar anointing over this room right now. I would ask that you would release the anointing to understand the times and the seasons and what we are to do. Lord, I call your people out of a place of wandering and into a place of strategy. Lord, I call your people out of the place of whatever will happen will happen into a place of I'm going to be led by the Spirit of God. Lord, I take authority over that spirit of Kesara Sarah, and I destroy that through the blood of the Lamb. And I decree and declare alignment, 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 strategy, 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 glory, glory, glory over your people. Hallelujah. And I decree and declare we're about to go from height to height in glory to glory in the Lord. The Lord says, get ready. We're about to enter a season like we've never entered into before. And strategy will be vitally necessary in this season like no other season. The Lord said that divine strategy, seek me for divine strategy from my throne. The Lord says, have I not told you through my servant to have your notebook and your pen ready at all times? Because the Lord says, you don't know when I'm going to speak. The Lord says, I'm going to begin to speak, but I will speak at inopportune times. I will speak in my timing and not your timing. For I'm calling you into my timing, says the Lord. I'm calling you into a new place in me, says the Lord. I'm calling you to position, says the Lord. The Lord says, submission will put you into position. The Lord says, I'm calling my people on their knees. Crouch into submission, and I will put you in position, says the Lord. You cannot function in this new season the way that you have in other seasons. For the enemy is coming with a strategy like never before. He's trying to wear down my saints. The Lord says you need a fresh anointing. You need a fresh strategy. You need to seek my face like never before. New, I am new every morning, says the Lord. And my people must gather my manna every morning, the Lord says. Gather my manna every morning, the Lord says. Early will I seek you. Early will I seek you. The Lord says in the season you must seek me early. You cannot wait until mid-season or the end of the season. There will be no catching up. The Lord says in this new season that I am taking you into, you must seek me early, says the Lord. And when you seek me early, you will seek my face. And you will see my face like never before. Strategy, 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 says the Lord. Strategy, 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 says the Lord. You need my strategy for this new season. Seek me early, seek me often, the Lord says. Seek my face. May seeking my face be the primary goal of every day. The Lord says from this point forward, seek my face, seek my face, seek my face, and you will see my face, says the Lord. Hallelujah. How many receive what the Lord is saying this morning? Hallelujah. So guys, I'm telling you, as I was sitting in the secret place yesterday, I think the Lord's going to just interweave this word with the prophetic. How many just received that in the Lord? I love it when he does that. The Lord was saying to me yesterday, and I think this is so important, that we're in a very important important time in the history of the church, and God is releasing things for this time, for this season, and for this generation. The Lord says this is a very strategic season, and He's releasing things right now for this time, this season, and this generation. <laughs> In fact, the Lord is saying, I am releasing strategy for the season. I am releasing strategy for the season, the Lord says. But the Lord says you aren't going to get this strategy from a good Christian book. The Lord says you're not going to get the strategy from a good Christian teaching or podcast. The Lord says you are going to get the strategy as you press in and seek my face. The Lord says, I'm releasing corporate strategy, but I'm also releasing individual strategy. 
He says, I'm releasing individual strategy and I'm releasing corporate strategy. Why? How many are hearing what he's saying? Yeah. We've got to understand this. As I was spending time with the Lord yesterday, the Lord took me into Habakkuk chapter 2. Let's go to Habakkuk this morning. Hallelujah. Let's go in the Old Testament. Hallelujah. Oh, how many love the Lord this morning? Hallelujah. If you get to uh, Malachi, you've gone too far. Habakkuk. Hallelujah. Glory. But how many know God's about to take us into things where the conservative church is going to say you've gone too far? Hallelujah. God's about to do things we've never seen Him do before. Habakkuk chapter 2, and we're going to start in verse 1. How many know that part of the strategy is going to be released to the intercessors? At the end of the age, the intercessory anointing, the intercessory calling is one of the most important callings that you'll walk in. I believe that God has called all of His people to be intercessors at the end of the age. How many are hearing this? Notice what Habakkuk says. He's speaking about what's going on in his generation, but I believe he's speaking through this generation and into ours. How many know that that's the power of a prophetic word? It transcends the generation in which it's spoken and it begins to go into a generation to be fully released at the strategic time of the Lord. And we are coming into the strategic timings of the Lord in the timeline. I'm seeing the timeline right now in the realm of the Spirit and I see these, these explosions of light in the timeline. And everywhere there's an explosion of light, it is a word that God has spoken that is now being manifested through strategic time in this generation. He says, we're going to understand what he meant when he said, for such a time as this. For such a time as this. Time, time, my time, my way, my alignment, strategy, strategy, strategy. Now notice what Habakkuk says, verse 1, he says, in chapter 2. He says, I will stand at my watch. Intercessors, the Lord says He wants you to stand at your watch. What is your watch? It's your post. It's your prophetic position. It's your place of intercession. God says stand at your post in this hour. Don't be moved. Don't let anything sway you. Stand at your post. You are watchmen on the walls. And what would the watchmen do? They'd stand on the walls. And they'd watch for the enemy to come. And when the enemy came, they'd blow the trumpet so everyone would be at their battle stations as the enemy tried to come over the wall. And the Lord said, Watchmen, if you fall asleep at the wall, the blood of the people will be on your hands. And the Lord says in this age, intercessors, He says, don't fall asleep at the wall. Don't leave your posts. Don't you love the heart of Habakkuk here? He says, I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint or this rebuke. It's interesting. He says, you know what? I'm an intercessor and I'm standing on the wall. And he said, I am listening for what the Lord is saying in the midst of my rebuke or in the midst of my complaints. He was complaining to the Lord about what was going on in his generation. He was saying, Lord, my generation is crooked. It's perverse. It's moved away from you. Lord, the, the church of my day doesn't know who you are. They've got a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. How do we see in our church age? See, that's the power of the prophetic seer. Hallelujah, because he's speaking in the R age just as much as he is his own. And I want you to notice the Lord responds to him. How many know the Lord doesn't respond to us based upon our desperation? He responds to us with his truth. And how many know Habakkuk desperately was praying about his generation, but the Lord saw into the timeline and what he was about to do. And he's going to speak that to Habakkuk. He says this, Then the Lord answered, Write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald, hallelujah, somebody say herald, yeah. or so that whoever reads it may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. 
Church, I'm telling you, we're coming into the appointed times of the Lord. We're coming into the appointed seasons of the Lord. We're coming into the appointed moves of the Lord. The Lord said, we need divine strategy for all three of those things. Is anybody hearing that? The Lord said, no more can people, are my people just let things come to them. They've got to seek me for the strategy. They've got to seek me for the strategy. How many hear this? Amen. For the revelation awaits an appointed Kairos or Kronos? Kairos. 60 seconds in a minute. That is Kronos time. It moves forward. The Lord says, I am the I'm greater than the timeline because I created time. So the Kronos goes like this. But what happens is, in God's strategic times, the Kairos comes into the Kronos and releases the supernatural. That's what's happening right now in revival in our nation. God's Kairos timing, His strategic timing, that's what Kairos means in the Greek. Strategic timing. God's strategic timing now is coming into the Kairos timeline and God is interrupting, He's intercepting, He's messing up the plans of man. And he's beginning to exert his holy will. And how many know he wants his people to have the strategy so that when these things happen, they are ready and they know what to do. Standing on the wall in the spirit of this cigar. Okay, hallelujah. So he says this. He says, write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. Whose time? God's timing. Prophetic words are in queue in the realms of the third heaven waiting to be released strategically. The Lord says, I'm carefully watching over my word to fulfill it. How many received that? And he says, by the way, church, I'm not slow in keeping my promises. As man would say that I'm slow. He says, my timing is my timing. You need to learn, the Lord says, how to walk in my timing. Well, Lord, how can we know how to walk in your timing? The Lord says, when you walk as a strategic believer at the end of the age. Yes. He says, I want to release my strategy to you. How many receive that? Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. He says, for the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and it will not prove false. Mm -hmm. Though it linger, wait for it. Whoa, 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 whoa. How many feel like God's promised you some things that haven't happened yet? Amen. Come on, let's be honest. How many feel that? Yeah. The Lord says right now a lot of people in the church are feeling a holy tension. They feel like they're trying to balance a marble on a razor blade right now. The Lord says. And they can feel this odd tension a tension between feeling like they're stuck in place, but feeling like there's a brand new season about to be broken loose at the same time. The other night in prayer, it was actually a couple of weeks back, I was feeling that, and I was feeling like I was sitting on the ground in prayer in the courtrooms of the third heaven, but I was kind of super glued to the ground. And I could feel God about to do something, but I couldn't seem to move. But I saw what looked like a holy crowbar come down and wedge itself and pop me out of that place and move me forward. I believe that's not just for me. I believe that's every, for every single one of us. I believe the Lord is saying His people have felt like they've been stuck in place. Like their feet have been super glued or their knees have been super glued to the ground in, in their secret place, in their place of prayer, in their prayer closet. But the Lord says, I'm about to break things loose. Amen. Now, whenever God speaks, I always ask Him why. I was that kid that always got in trouble growing up. His mom and dad would say not to do something, I always say why. I didn't say why to be rebellious. I wanted to understand the why. I wanted to understand, son, don't touch the stove. Why? You'll get burnt. But guess what I got from my mom growing up? Don't ask me why. Just don't do it. Right? Or don't ask me why. Just do it. Depending on this, whatever the situation was, I wanted, always wanted to know the word. That I always wanted to know the why behind what they were saying to me. You know what? The Lord is saying, we've been waiting, we've been waiting, we've been waiting. 
for his promises to be revealed, for prophetic words to manifest. And I can feel the people right now on the edge of their seats feeling like the, the latter glory that's so much greater than the former glory is about to manifest. But at the same time, they almost feel like they're, they're glued to the seats and they can't just quite get to that place. The Lord is saying, it happens in my timing and not yours. That's the why. He says, my timing versus your timing. And the Lord says, as you seek me for divine strategy, part of what I want to teach you at the end of the age is how to walk in my timing. The Lord Jesus said, that's why in my earthly ministry, I only did what I saw the Father doing. The Lord says at the pool of Bethsaida, there were hundreds there that needed healing. I only healed one man. Why? Because that's the only one I saw the Father healing. Was his heart to heal everybody at the pool? Absolutely it was. But he only did what he saw the Father doing. The Lord says through intimacy and surrender and submission, I want to teach you how to be a people of my timing and that will be very strategic at the end of the age. Because the Lord said there's some things that I promised you that the enemy wants you to rush into ill-prepared. And the very moment of destiny that I have called to be a moment of glory in your life, the enemy wants you to spontaneously combust at that particular point because you did it not in my timing, but your timing. I want to teach you how to be a Kairos people. Jesus was thinking about going to the feast and his brother said, go, go, go reveal yourself there. And they were saying it sarcastically. And he looked at them and said, I must stay in the Father's timing. But he said, you go because any time is good for you. Have I ever read that? The Lord says, I want to take my people from any time, Kronos, to my time, Kairos. And the Lord said, that will be a complete different mindset that I'm giving you. Because the Lord said, you are used to Kronos time. You've grown up with Kronos time. You know when to get up. You know when you lie down. The Lord says, I know when you get up. I know when you lie down. And I want to teach you my timing in everything. I want to make my people much more strategic. How many hear what the Lord is saying? Let's go to verse 3 again. Habakkuk 2. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end. It will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. Now I want you to notice the very last part of verse 3. In my Bible, I've got a note that says this. The word it in Hebrew was actually the word he. So though it linger, wait for it. He will certainly come. It will not delay. Let me ask you a question. Who is the he? Jesus. And we're about to see Jesus show up in ways he never has before. The church is waiting for him to come through the clouds to fulfill what the word says in Thessalonians. The Lord says, stop looking at the clouds. Yes. How many remember when Jesus ascended? What were they all doing? Yeah. And what did the angel say that showed up? Men of Israel, stop looking in the clouds. For the way that he went up is the way that he will return. Go! That's what the Lord's saying to the church right now. He's saying, stop looking at the clouds for my second coming. He says, start looking and seeing what I'm doing in the earth and the earth. He said, just as I said, my father is always working. And I said, as the father sent me, so I send you. The Lord Jesus said, I am always working. Therefore, look and see what I'm doing. I am always working. How many hear what the Lord is saying right now? He says, I'm always working. And he says this, I will certainly come and I will not delay. I don't think you heard that. He said, I will certainly come. I will not delay. Can I hear an amen? amen. See, we've got to understand this. God's word is going to be fulfilled. 
Every single word that the Lord spoke to us in the Bible, every single prophetic word that's been spoken over your life is going to be fulfilled, but it's going to happen in God's timing as you surrender to Him and you wait as you linger for Him to bring it forth. How many are hearing what the Lord is saying right now? And the Lord says some are getting very anxious right now. They're getting holy ants in their pants, so to speak. Because they're waiting for something to happen. The Lord says you keep seeking. You keep trusting. You keep listening. You keep pressing in. And the Lord says watch what I'm about to do. How many received that in the Lord? He said to remind His people this day that He said heaven and earth will pass away, but His word will endure forever. How many hear that? And we've got to understand this, guys. And you've heard me say this before, but Holy Spirit was speaking this to me again yesterday. He said, we're coming into a time when more prophetic words and promises of the Lord are being fulfilled than in any other point in history. He said this to me yesterday. We're at the most strategic point in the timeline of God. He said, we're in the most strategic point of the timeline of God. Heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of the Lord will endure forever. We're in the most strategic point of the timeline at the end of the age. Yes. You look at the words of the Old Testament prophets, major and minor. Many of the words they spoke were not only fulfilled in their generation or quickly thereafter, but they were all, their greatest fulfillment is at the end of the age. And right now in heaven, as part of the great cloud of witnesses, the Lord is saying, are many of the major and the minor prophets, and they're crying out before the Lord, Lord, remember the words that you spoke to me over my generation that have carried down the timeline to the end generation. Lord, when will these words be fulfilled? Yes. And not that the Lord would ever forget those words, but they won't let him at the same time. And they're asking the Lord before the throne, when is this word going to be fulfilled? When is this word going to be fulfilled? When is this word going to be fulfilled? And here we are in the earthly realm asking the Lord, when is this word going to be fulfilled? When is this word going to be fulfilled? When is this word going to be fulfilled? And the Lord is saying, in my Kairos timing, yes. the Lord says, stay at your post. Watch at your post like Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 1. I will stand at my post and I will trust God to bring forth His Word in His strategic time. How many received this? The Lord said, we're about to understand what He meant when He said for such a time as this. That wasn't just for Esther through Mordecai. For such a time as this. For such a Kairos time as this. For such a time as this. Somebody say that. For such a time as this. <laughs> and the Lord is saying in this hour it's more crucial to walk in the spirit of Issachar than ever before. The Lord says, I am pouring out strategic mantles and anointings over my people in this hour. And the Lord says, one of the most important is out of 1 Chronicles 12.32. And it is the Issachar anointing. And men came from the tribe of Issachar and they understood the times and they understood the seasons. And church, because they understood the times and the seasons, not man's time, but God's timing, then they knew what to do. Yes. And the Lord says, I want to teach you how to walk in tune with my time and my seasons, and then you will know what to do. Is anybody hearing what the Spirit of the Lord is saying today? This is very important. Now, it's very interesting as we study the Old Testament, and you hear me say this all the time, that part of the challenge with the Western church is, is that we have a Greek mindset. That's right. And part of the reason why we have a Greek mindset is because many in the Western church are New Testament people. In fact, how many other Bibles did you get today that's the New Testament only? The New Testament and Psalms. How many know there's so much more word than that? Amen? And what we've got to understand is the Old Testament is filled with types and shadows. David was a type. Daniel was a type. Solomon was a type. How many are hearing this? They were types. Joseph was a type. Joseph was a picture of the Lord Jesus as the deliverer, as the provider. 
David was a type. The Lord Jesus as prophet, priest, and king. They were shadows. They were pictures. How many know Christ fulfilled them all? Yes. We've got to understand this as we go into looking at a shadow this morning. And I really believe in the Lord. The greatest shadow that we can look at in the Old Testament is the Passover. Is the Passover. So on the eve of Holy Week, we're going to take a look at the significance of the Passover. It's the greatest shadow of the Old Testament. But we've got to understand this right now. The shadows of the Old Testament are becoming our reality at the end of the age. Let me say that again. The shadows that we see in the Old Testament are becoming our realities at the end of the age. The things that Israel has been doing for generations and generations and generations, and they've been doing them not understanding truly what they're all about, especially the Hasidic Jews, the Lord said those were types and shadows that are about to be fulfilled. So let's take a look at this, and I believe God's going to bless us this morning. Let's go to Colossians chapter 2 and verse 16. How many love the Lord Jesus this morning? Yes, amen. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 16. <clears throat> now as we talk about a type this morning, the Passover, I want you to keep in mind, church, that the Lord is not calling us back into legalism. He's not calling us into the law. He's not calling us to become like the Jews. If we become like the Jews, then how are we going to stir them to jealousy through a passionate love for Jesus? Okay, But he is wanting to give us an understanding of why the Jews do the things that they do. Now notice the word says in, in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 16, Therefore do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. Now this is important. There's a move in the church right now to go back to Judaism. Because people think that somehow there's a spirituality in that. Paul completely debunks that in Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. Because he starts out by saying, don't let anybody judge you by what the law had dictated. Okay? But notice now the truth that we see here, the importance of the next verse, verse 17. For these are a shadow of the things that were to come. Somebody say shadow. Shadow. Now this is interesting and important to us. That word shadow there in the Greek is the word skia. S-K-I-A. And the word skia means a shadow, shade, thick darkness, or an outline. Isn't that interesting? So Paul was saying to the church, he was saying those things were just an outline. They were just a dark shadow of what was to come. But notice what he says next, and this is what we need to grab a hold of. The reality, however, is found in Christ. So what was the Passover? It was a shadow, but the true fulfillment, the true reality, the true power is in Christ. Oh, you got to grab a hold of this. And the Lord right now is calling the church out of the shadows of religion and into the reality of intimacy with Jesus. He's calling us out of the shadow. What did David say in Psalm 23? He says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. The Lord says, I'm calling my people out of the shadows. And I'm calling them into the realities of who I am. How many received that in the Lord? Amen. Hallelujah. So what was Paul saying to this church? He was saying that Paul started all these churches. And when he walked away from those churches or went to start other churches, he wrote them letters. We know that. But what happened was as he went to start other churches, wolves came in. And they came in as false teachers. And one of the major teachings that he had to deal with was people would come behind him into these churches and they would say, yes, salvation is through Jesus, but you also have to do all these other things. And Paul would hear this and he'd write letters and say things like, who has bewitched you? Whoa, that's pretty heavy, isn't it? 
He'd say, who has put a witchcraft spell over you, is what he said. That when you found this freedom in Christ, this has caused you to want to go back to the shadow. The Lord says, I'm calling you out of the shadow and into the reality of what I have for you. How many know the word says, hallelujah, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Hallelujah. There is liberty. There is freedom. In fact, the word says in 2 Corinthians 3, 6, the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Why does the letter kill? Because we can never measure up to the letter. Why does the Spirit give life? Because Holy Spirit brings grace. So we've got to understand this. And you hear me teach this all the time, but I'm going to teach it till we get it. We've got to understand in the Old Testament, the Old Testament was about what you did. That was the shadow. You went to temple. You sacrificed the lamb. You didn't eat pork. You abstained from this. You didn't do that. Right. How many know that was the law? You can't, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't. And if you could, it was something that wasn't necessarily appealing. That was the law. But the problem was Paul said the law was against us. Because Jesus said if you break one commandment, you've broken them. And this was the problem with the Old Testament and the Old Covenant or the law or the system. It was the shadow and we could never walk in the shadow the way we could in the light. And we could never fulfill the Old Covenant or the law. Why? Because God initiated it, but then we had the responsibility to walk in our part of it, and we never could. That's why when the Lord Jesus came, He came as the Son of God and the Son of Man. Why did He do that? He came as the Son of God because He initiated a new covenant, a better covenant with better promises. But here's the problem. We couldn't live up to that one either. So he also came as the son of man so he could fulfill the God side of the new covenant and the man side of the covenant at the same time. Son of God, son of man. How many received that? What does that mean to us? The Old Testament or the law was all about what we did. The new covenant or salvation in Christ Jesus is all about what he did. That's why there's freedom. How many are catching this? And this is the beauty, this is the beauty of the Passover. How many are hearing the Lord today? See, the law is the shadow, but Christ is the substance. I don't think you got that. See, the law is the shadow, Christ is the substance. But here's the thing, the enemy loves to get in. And what does the enemy say to the church? Salvation cannot be that simple. Surely it's not as simple as you receiving what Christ did and His grace and becoming like Him. Surely it can't be that simple. It's got to be that plus this plus this plus that plus this plus this plus that plus this. It has to be what Jesus did plus what you can do. Church, how many know that without Christ we can do nothing? <laughs> Amen? So what is the new covenant all about? It's stepping into the reality of what Jesus did. And through the blood of Jesus, the fulfillment of the law and substance, we can become everything that we can never become apart from Him. And His grace is there to help us every step of the way. How many receive that? So you know what? We should have a whole lot of joy. We should have a whole lot of peace. We should have a whole lot of excitement because of what Jesus did. Because in the Old Testament, they're sacrificing the lamb. Hallelujah. But how many know, and we've got to understand this, Jesus entered Jerusalem on the very woo, beginning of the Passover as the spotless Passover lamb to be crucified. Hallelujah. He's the fulfillment. In the Old Testament, they brought the lamb. In the New Testament, we receive the lamb in everything that he did for us. Is anybody getting this? Well, well, Pastor, you know, this this is kind of some, this is stuff, you know, kind of elementary stuff you're teaching today. No, it's not. We need to get a revelation of the power of the blood of Jesus. Because the power of the blood of Jesus changes things. Can I hear an amen? So we've got to understand something. Today we're looking at the greatest shadow 
in the Old Testament, the Passover, but we've got to understand that God's truths are hidden in the shadows. But the fullness is found in Christ. And this morning, I was just spending some time studying. In fact, Hannah was driving, and I'm in the middle seat of the van, and I'm just studying and spending more time with the Lord. And I, and I heard the Lord as He took me back to this in my notes. As the Lord said, great truths are hidden in God's shadows. I heard the Lord say, I'm giving you the treasures hidden in darkness. Hallelujah. Isaiah 45. Hallelujah. So guys, I want to tell you something that God's doing right now. He's taking us into the shadows of the old covenant mm. so he can shine light on things that are hidden there mm. to reveal them to the church at the end of the age, things <coughs> that the church has not known in previous generations. Amen. Why? It's his kairos timing Amen. to do so. Amen. It's the glory of God to conceal a matter. Amen. It's the glory of kings to search it out or to search a matter out. Meaning what? God has hidden things in the dark shadows of the old covenant that he is about to reveal to his end times covenant people that have divine strategy in them that we're going to use against the enemy at the end of the age. Oh, that better get us excited. That better get us excited. Come on. And we're going to learn great things from some dark shadows. Pastor Sidney, can you give us Psalm 119, verse 18? Psalm 119, verse 18. Guys, I want you to see this. How many are enjoying the Word? Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Psalm 119, verse 18. And this is very important for us today. How many are in love with Jesus? Amen. 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 How many are in love with the Lord? Amen. So I want us to see this because this is going to set the tone as we begin to look at a shadow. Okay? This is going to set the tone as we begin to work to look at a shadow. And the Word of God says this, and David spoke this, he said, open my eyes that I may see wonderful things from your law. What? <laughs> so that I can see wonderful things from your law? I couldn't eat pork. I couldn't eat shrimp. Crab legs with butter were completely off the menu. Anybody hearing what I'm saying? Okay, now you, you know I'm joking with this, but here's the thing. David said, Lord, open my eyes because I want to see what's hidden in the shadow. Whoa. I want to see what's hidden in the shadow. And guys, listen to this because this is important. The Lord says, open my eyes that I may see wonderful things. That word wonderful or wondrous in the Hebrew is the word pala, P-A-L-A, -A, and it means extraordinary. So the Lord says, open my eyes so that I may see extraordinary things in your law. And before we get lost in that word law, that word law in the Hebrew means Torah. And this is interesting. The word Torah, and we understand that's Genesis through Deuteronomy, according to the Jews, right? That word Torah means direction, instruction, law, or teaching. You could literally read this psalm this way. Lord, open up my eyes that I may see extraordinary things in your teaching. Whoa. Hold on. So what are the shadows of the Old Testament? They're teachings. What is the law? It was a teaching. What does God want to begin to show us in the law and in the shadows? Extraordinary things that no other generation has ever seen. How many are hearing what the Lord is saying? Amen. Okay. Powerful. And David understood this. So I'm going to call this the shadow perspective. So today we're going to start walking in the shadow perspective. And we're going to keep in mind Isaiah 45. It's the glory of God to conceal a matter. It's the glory of kings to do what? For he's giving us the treasures hidden in darkness. So the Passover is the very first feast that God instituted for Israel. So we're going to refer back to the law first mention. Yeah. And remember the law first mention tells us whenever something is initiated in the word for the very first time, 
That is going to set the tone for the way that it should be interpreted every time we see it thereafter in the word, Old Covenant and New Covenant. Amen. So Israel has how many feasts traditionally during the year? Seven. Seven feasts traditionally broken down to four and three when we're looking at spring and fall. Now we need to understand this. The seven feasts of Israel, Passover, Unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and tabernacles. Those are the seven feasts of Israel. They are shadows. They are shadows. The Lord established the very first feast, and it happened in the day of Moses. It happened back in Exodus, okay, in the Word. How many know if it's the very first feast that God established, there's a good possibility it's the most important. So we've got to understand this. And in the Passover we see a lamb that was slain. Let me ask you a question. What is the shadow we're already seeing in Passover? That a lamb was going to be slain. And the lamb that was going to be slain is going to be a lamb that was going to be slain eventually once and for all so no other lambs would have to be slain ever again. The lamb is the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So keep in mind, after that first feast of Passover, every time you see a lamb mentioned in the Bible, we need to think Jesus because of the law first mentioned. But we've got to understand the seven feasts of Israel that they're still celebrating every year. Even though many in Israel don't know who Christ is, although there is a growing number of Messianic Jews in Israel, there is revival happening and rabbis are getting saved and the Lord is telling them, don't come out of the proverbial holy closet until you study the New Testament and understand the New Covenant and then come out and reveal the fact that you believe Jesus is Yeshua. The seven feasts that Israel still celebrates every year, they're a shadow. All seven feasts have to be fulfilled in history for Jesus to return. Yes. What does the number seven mean in the Hebrew? Completion. Completion. What is the number eight? New, beginning. New beginnings. God created the earth in how many days? Six days he created the earth, and on the seventh day he rested. Okay. What's the eighth day? It's the day of new beginnings. Mm -hmm. When Israel came into the... And by the way, that's a law of first mention. Okay, Genesis 1 and 2. Then the children of Israel come to the promised land. And the Lord says, okay, when the promised land is conquered and you go back to farming, or you start farming, it's, it's a little different in Egypt, and in the, in the wilderness, the Lord said, you will plant the ground for six years. Yeah. He said, in the seventh year, you will let the ground go fallow. It's a seventh year or a Sabbath year. The Lord said, if you will plant six years, at the end of the sixth year, you will receive such an abundant harvest that you will eat it through the seventh year, and you'll still be eating it in the harvest of the eighth year. Yeah. Obedience was the key. Why did the Babylonian exile take place? Because they ignored the Lord's Sabbath principle for seven cycles. Seven times ten is seventy years, the length of the Babylonian captivity. Is anybody catching this? So what happened, or what was God's Sabbath principle for the land? Print, you are going, you are to plant six years, let the ground grow fallow the seventh year, and what was the eighth year? It was the year of new beginnings, because the soil was refreshed and renewed and ready to produce like never before. Yes. Okay. The same principle is there with the feasts. Those seven feasts have to be fulfilled in history, and then Jesus returns on the eighth day, so to speak. Okay. So, how far are we in this process? <laughs> My brother Ben just said, close. <laughs> so we've got to understand this. This is part of the spirit of Issachar. The Lord Jesus on the week that he was to be betrayed and crucified, came in that week, and it was the Passover. He was the Passover lamb who was going to come and be slain and be the final Passover lamb that needed to be slain in history. Is anybody catching this? Is Israel still observing the Passover? Absolutely they are. 
But spiritually, he's the last lamb that would ever need to be slain. How many are catching this? So he comes into Jerusalem over the Passover. He fulfills the first feast in history. That week, there's three feasts celebrated that week. Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. Unleavened bread was all about Israel making dough without yeast. The night that they are going to leave Egypt and come into the promised land. What did Jesus say when they're eating the Last Supper? This is my body which will be broken for your sake. This is the cup that represents my blood that will be shed for you. Jesus' broken body fulfilled the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He was sinless. What is leaven a picture of? Sin. He was sinless. When he died and rose again, he became the first fruits among the brethren, Paul said. He fulfilled the first three feasts in one week. Then what happens a number of days later in the upper room during the time of another feast when the Holy Spirit was poured out? That was during Pentecost. So Acts chapter 2, outpouring of the Holy Ghost, was the fulfillment of the fourth feast in history. Wow. That's amazing, isn't it, church? So that means all that we have left are trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles. What is tabernacles, the very last feast? God dwelling amongst men. It's the millennial reign of Christ. Hallelujah. And what's the eighth day? The wedding feast of the Lamb. Is anybody catching this? So where are we at right now? Many would argue prophetically, we're coming through atonement and we're getting very, very close to tabernacles. What's part of atonement? Atonement is Jesus' blood being shed for us. He becomes the atoning sacrifice so we can become what we could never become without him. I believe a sign of atonement is the revivals that God's beginning to pour out and an awakening in people coming and turning to him. Guys, I really believe we're coming through atonement and we're coming into tabernacles very quickly. Oh, come on now. By the way, what was tabernacles all about when they moved? when they built booths in the wilderness to live in. Even now during tabernacles in Israel, they will build booths on top of their house and live in them during this time because it's a picture of them coming into the wilderness and living in the wilderness. But what comes after the wilderness? The promised land. See, Jesus comes for his church and rules and reigns in tabernacles. And I will be your God and you will be my people and I will dwell amongst you. Promised land is eternity with him. How many are catching this? See, the seven feasts are shadows. And the seven feasts have to be fulfilled prophetically for Jesus to come back. We've got to understand that it's part of his strategic timing. Does that mean we need to celebrate all the feasts and do all these things? No, that was the shadow. Christ is the fulfillment. How many are catching what he's saying? Guys, there's an anointing in this room. Want us to hold on to this because this is very important in the Lord. So let's go to Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 to 6. This is the most important shadow in the entire word. And guess what, guys? We're coming in to Passover week. Now, again, you know me, the Lord rarely ever has me preach messages in line with a lot of things that are going on in the calendar. The Lord said, you're going to preach on Passover today. Okay. So how many are there? Exodus chapter 12. Now, we need to understand some powerful things that are going on here. The Lord says this, And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of the year. Now, we've got to understand something here. God is not only establishing the first feast, he's establishing the first month of their calendar at the same time. We have two new beginnings going on at once. Which means what? In the Lord, multiple new beginnings can happen at one time. And the Lord, Holy Spirit just told me to remind this group that many times God brings life out of death. Okay. I'm going to leave that one at that. 
Okay. So the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Woo, hallelujah. In Egypt, by the way, what is Egypt a picture of? The world. Bondage. God is speaking to Moses and Aaron in the midst of bondage. Israel is still in bondage. They've been in bondage for 430 years. You know what this tells us? Even after 430 years, God can birth a new beginning. Amen. He can make something out of nothing. Yes. He speaks to that which is not as if it yes. is and it becomes. The Lord says, I can change in a moment what you struggled with all your life. And the Lord said, there's a lot of those shifts beginning to come over these people. The Lord said, even for people in this room, you've been praying and pushing against mountains for years. The Lord says, those mountains are about to move. The Lord says, it hasn't been that you don't walk in mountain moving faith like the enemy has tried to tell you. It was, it was not time for the mountains to be moved. My timing, isn't that what we keep hearing through the verses today? My timing, my revelation awaits an appointed time. So does his deliverance. You didn't even get saved when you wanted to. He drew you. The word says no one comes to Jesus unless drawn by the Father. When did you get saved? It wasn't because you determined you were a miserable wretch and you needed a Savior. You got saved when you were drawn. And you responded to his choosing. John 15, 16, you didn't choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go forth and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then you'll ask of the Father whatsoever he will in my name. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he'll give it to you. Mm -hmm. See, you've got to understand the timing of your life is so strategic. <clears throat> you were conceived at the time that he chose for you. Yeah. You were birthed at the time that he chose to you, for you. In the family that he chose for you. Well, that one, some are going, oh, man. <laughs> woo! So they say the Beverly Hillbillies, woo, the doggies. <laughs> All right. So, well, younger folks, you're going, So are some of the seasoned folks. Right. See, your entire life is Kairos. Your entire life is Kairos. You are a person of Kairos timing walking in a Kronos world. That's why you don't fit, you don't belong, and people don't understand you. And the enemy is trying to say it's just because you're weird. No, you're not. You're a Kronos person walking in a Kairos. You're a Kairos person walking in a Kronos world. You are a being of light walking in a world of darkness. How are you hearing what the Lord is saying? Okay. Woo! Still in the presence of the Lord. The Lord said, This month is to be for you the first month, the month of your year. Nisan ultimately is what it's going to be. You know when that happens? Between March and April. Yes. Where are we at right now? <coughs> Technically, and John just put it out there to you yesterday. It was when the month began. And the Lord has me teaching on it today. He's teaching on it. He says, tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb. Now, it's interesting because it could have been a lamb or it could have been a kid. It could have been a goat. But historically, it was going to be a lamb. And he's to take it for his family, one for each household. And if any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with the nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb that's needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animal you choose must be one-year-old males without defect. And you are to take them from the sheep or the goats. That's where the kid comes in. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Church, that's what they did for the Passover. When was the first Passover? The first Passover was as they were about to see the final plague come through Egypt. And they were going to be dislodged. Yes. Now, remember I told you, many of us have been feeling like our, our, our feet are super glued to the ground. Mm -hmm or our knees are super glued to the ground in our secret places where we're praying, and we know something amazing is coming, but we just can't seem to get past that place. Yeah. Passover was when God dislodged Israel from Egypt. Uh -huh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They had been in bondage 
for 430 years. And in one night, God was going to dislodge them. That's a shadow. You know what that tells us? What we struggled with our entire lifetime, what our family line has struggled with for generations, God can change in a moment. Yes. That's why there's people in this room, you are the forerunner for your families. You're the forerunner in relationship with Jesus. You're the forerunner in breaking the family curses. You're the forerunner in going after God's destiny. You're the forerunner of hope. You're the example. You're the Jesus to your family. Hallelujah. And our God is the God of household salvation. Comes up. Hallelujah. Glory. The Lord is moving in this room right now as you're receiving that truth. We're receiving right now breakthrough that we didn't even get in praise and worship. The Lord is in this room and He is breakthrough and He's releasing the spirit of breakthrough. The Lord says there are many in this room that are forerunners. And for the forerunners, you will break curses that your family has walked in for generations. Oh, come on now. But guys, let me say this. Being the forerunner isn't easy. Because you feel a lot of weight. Because the ground that you gain isn't just for you. It's for your entire family. And I can start naming families who have forerunner representatives in this house right now. And I'm going to tell you right now, guys, one of them is the McGuire family. I'm telling you, there are three McGuire's in this house, but the day is going to come soon when we see Uncle Ed again and a whole lot of more McGuire's in this house. Yeah. Because that is a destiny family. Yes. And God says, one of these days, there's going to be a whole section I'm going to look at when I'm preaching. Well, the Holy Ghost does the preaching, but while the preaching is going on, there's going to be a whole section of McGuire's. Because God's going to have done that much healing and restoration and deliverance in the family. I'm telling you, Josiah, Liz, Uncle Pat, you guys are forerunners for your family. And the enemy's trying to tell you you're insignificant and your life ain't going to change a thing. He's only said that because he knows you're forerunners. And he fears what you're letting God do in your lives right now because it's not just for you it's for your whole family John's a forerunner for the Harold family I can start going through this whole place there's a whole lot of forerunners in this place can I hear an amen, amen. see God's releasing a lot of truth today isn't he yes. by the way John the Baptist was a forerunner and look what happened to him yeah. being a forerunner is about dying mm -hmm. it's about being a Passover lamb in some ways I'm going to be real honest with you guys it's not easy. It's not easy. My dad was the forerunner for his family. And out of a family that had generations of preachers, all of a sudden the family came in the darkness. But here's my dad in Hannibal, Missouri. And while he's a little boy growing up, he was a man of destiny and he didn't even know it. Very interesting, growing up he had a barber there in Hannibal. It was kind of like Mayberry where there was one barber shop. And he had this barber that cut his hair the entire time he was growing up. Dad figured out after he got saved, that barber was saved, spirit-filled, Pentecostal, and spoke over him every time he cut his hair. Yeah. Yeah. My mom and dad don't get saved until they're in their 30s. And my mom is carrying me in 1969. She's traveling down an old country road, gets morning sickness, gets out of the 1969 Ford Galaxy that she's driving. <laughs> <laughs> goes to the side of the road, up Chucks, looks up, she's in front of a Baptist church that has a lit revival sign in front of the church, said revival tonight. Mm -hmm. I was in her womb. Yeah. Oh. Glory. My mom and dad go to service that night. I'm in, in my mom's womb. They both get saved. Yeah. They go back again a week later and they both surrender the ministry. Then they go back home to Hannibal and they lead the majority of the family <laughs> to the Lord. That's so, for her. Yeah. Sometimes though, forerunners work for years before they see any progress. Mm -hmm. Sometimes being a forerunner is like breaking rocks. But you know what, forerunners? Stay at your post and be who you're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. You are going to see God bless the seeds that you're planting. Yeah. And God's going to use those two boys in a mighty, mighty way. Yeah. He's not let them leave my spirit since they came that Sunday. God's got his hand of destiny on those two boys. You watch what's going to happen. 
See, whatever God does in a generation through the forerunners, the next generation gets the double dose. It's Elijah to Elisha. But both are very important because Elisha doesn't come at the end of the age. Elisha does, Malachi 4. How many are catching this? And he turns the hearts of the fathers and mothers to the children, the hearts of the mothers and the children of the fathers. So, so the hearts of the children of the mothers and fathers so he doesn't have to strike the land with a curse. How many are catching this? Mm -hmm. Elijah holds back the curse. I see Elijah's all over this room. Now I want us to understand four very important aspects of the Passover. Number one, the Lord says this. He says, kill the lamb. See, how many know there's no remission of sin unless there's the shedding of blood? Because the life is in the the Lord says, number two, I want you to take that lamb. The Lord says, number one, take that lamb and kill it. Number two, he says, then I want you to eat what you killed. Mm -hmm. Now, this is very interesting. What did they cook? Because they didn't cook the whole thing. They cooked the head. They cooked the legs. And they cooked the entrails. Now, we know there's meat that was also involved in that process. We understand that. They didn't cook everything. Part of that lamb was burned in the fire. And what they cooked, they ate. What is the head? It's the mind. It's taking in the mind of Christ. What are the legs? That's movement. Moving in the things of the Lord. And being who we're supposed to be. What are the entrails? It's allowing the Lord to do a work of restoration, healing, and deliverance deep within you. Purifying and cleansing your soul. How many received that? Yeah. So they were to kill the lamb. They were to eat the lamb. Then they were to put the blood on the doorposts. And then they were going to have to trust the Lord that deliverance was finally coming. How many hear this? Mm -hmm. So they had to kill the lamb. They had to eat the lamb. They had to put the blood on the doorposts. And they had to eat fully clothed with their, to their, their cloak tucked into the belt like they're ready to leave at any moment. And by the way, they had to do all four things in order to see the Lord's deliverance. How many are hearing what the Lord is saying? But we need to understand this, and I'm going to come back to this in just a moment. That was a shadow. What is a shadow? It's a picture of the substance of what is to come. And how many know that the substance came when Jesus died on the cross? Amen. So we've got to understand this. Israel, traditional Hasidic Israel, is about to partake of the Passover. Do you know it's a picture of them partaking of Jesus, whether they realize it or not? Amen. Whether they recognize him or not, it's a picture of them partaking of Jesus. How do you receive that? Amen. So here's the interesting thing about this, guys, and, and, and we've got to understand this, is that the Lord said, first, I want you to kill the lamb. Now, we don't understand this because most of us aren't farmers. Okay, we've got some farmers in the back, but we, we, you know, most of us don't understand this. See, what the Lord says is the Passover really begins at the first day of the first month. And the Lord says, you're going to take a lamb out of your flock, Spotless lamb, around a year old, a male, without blemish. Okay, well, that's a real big overview. Let me tell you what the Lord really had them do. The first day of the month, they would take their kids out to the sheep pen. And as a family, they would pick out a lamb together. But they wouldn't put a little pink bow around the, the lamb's neck. They would that day separate the lamb from the flock and they would literally take that lamb into their home. They would feed that lamb at the dinner table. The kids would pet that lamb. That little lamb might have ended up in the kids' beds for 14 days. How many here have pets? You get attached? Yeah. At the end of 14 days, how attached do you think the kids were to that little lamb? And now they had to take that lamb in the midst of the congregation and they would put their hand on that lamb as a family. And it would be a picture of their sin transferring onto that lamb. And then the kids would have to watch as that little lamb's 
throat was slit. Now, many of us kind of look at that and we go, oh, Ben just did in the front row. Oh. But you, what was God teaching Israel in that? What was the why? He wanted that to be the time when the dads taught their kids and grandkids how terrible sin is. And that sin requires a sacrifice of blood. Do you think that started teaching the kids every time they're about to sin to think about it? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's also interesting that the Lord said, you eat the whole lamb that was cooked. Any part of the lamb that wasn't eaten, they were to burn in the fire the next day. Mm -hmm. But the design was, you take enough lamb that everyone eating it will eat everything that's cooked. You know what that is a picture of us for us today in the church? We're to eat of all of Jesus. Eat the whole lamb. How many know that in America, in the church, we're used to buffeting Jesus? Yeah. You know what? I want a little bit of this, and I want a little bit of that, but I don't really like that over there, and I want some of this. And you've got a lot of people who love the Jesus of the Word, but oh, the Holy Spirit side of that lamb. Oh, oh no, 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 no. I, I don't want to touch that. And you know, the surrender part of the lamb and the sacrifice. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm not going to eat that part of the lamb. No, the Lord said you eat the whole lamb. You take on the mind of Christ, the movement of Christ, the healing of Christ. You eat the whole lamb. How many know when we read the word, we need to receive the whole word? Genesis to Revelation. Come on. And when we hear from the Holy Spirit, we need to eat of the whole word of the Holy Spirit. What Holy Spirit says will never contradict the Bible that's in your hand because God is one. Israel would say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. The Lord is one. One God. He is the Lord. And you'll love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then Jesus added to that, and you'll love your neighbor as yourself. But they weren't done because they would also catch the blood from the slit throat of the lamb. And what they would do is they would go to the doorposts with that bowl of blood and they would take hyssop. David talked about hyssop in the Psalms. It was a picture of healing. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be cleansed or healed, David said. And they'd take a big glob of that hyssop and they'd dip it in the blood and they'd put it on the doorposts. But they didn't just put it on the doorpost any way they wanted to. They went left, right, top. That's a picture of the cross. Isn't that interesting? By the way, when Jesus was being beaten with a cat of nine tails to a very close point of his death, they beat him left shoulder, right shoulder, back. That was the method by which they would beat you with a cat of nine tails. Yeah. How many know the very first time they did that Passover, they were prophetically releasing Jesus? Yeah. How many catch that? Mm -hmm. Generations before he came, in faith, they were going, Jesus, yeah. Jesus, Jesus. It's interesting, though, the Lord said left doorpost, right doorpost, center doorpost. He didn't say put any on the ground. Why? Because we should never trample the blood of Jesus yes. under our feet. Mm -hmm. See, the blood of Jesus is sacred. Yeah. How many received that? Mm -hmm. And then they had to trust the Lord that deliverance was coming. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a picture of salvation. We're saved through the shed blood of the Lamb. Now it's time to eat of the whole Lamb. Let Him cover every part of us in His blood. <laughs> Sanctify us, heal us, deliver us. And then trust that he's not only done that for us, but he's done that for our families. Come on. See, we've got to understand that. You know, it's interesting. Paul brings up a verse that kind of makes some in the church scratch their head. The Lord says when there's a believing spouse and there's an unbelieving spouse, he says the believing spouse sanctifies or covers the unbelieving spouse. Yeah. Therefore, if the unbelieving spouse doesn't want to leave but stays in the marriage, let him stay in the marriage, Paul said. How many know that? Now, Paul wasn't saying that the unbelieving spouse is saved through the believing spouse. What he said was the unbelieving spouse is covered. There's a protection there. What does that mean? Those of you that are forerunners for your family, there's a covering that comes over your family because of you. Yeah. 
There's a chupa. There's a covering. There's that word. There's a covering because of you. How many receive that? Amen. Now, do people in your family still need to be saved? Absolutely, they do. But your openness to Jesus creates an openness for them to Jesus. And the ground you take, they're going to be able to take. Is anybody catching this? That's why the Lord said that the part of the dough that's taken that's made of the showbread is holy. The whole dough is holy. Is anybody catching this? We've got to understand the way God sees things. Somebody say amen. amen. Now this is what I really want us to see because this is so important. All of this is crucial. But let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 1. How many are enjoying this word? Amen. And I want to show you something. I want us to unmask something that the enemy is trying to do in the church. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 1. Paul is speaking to the church of Corinth. Corinth was a very demonic city. I want you to notice what the word says. Paul says this, So I made up my mind, the mind of Christ that was in him helped him make up his mind, that I would not make another painful visit to you. For I grieve who is left to make me glad, but you whom I have grieved. I wrote you as I did, so that when I came, I should not be distressed by those who ought to make me rejoice. How many are hearing what the Lord is saying? Amen. Now, I want us to see something because this is very important in the Lord. He says this, I have confidence in all of you that you would all share in my joy for I wrote you out of great distress and anguish of heart with many tears, not to grieve you, but to let you know the depth of my love for you. How many know when Paul started a church, Paul fell in love with that church because Jesus loved that church? How many hear that in the Lord? So we need to understand that about Paul. But we also need to understand this about Paul. Paul would say, he would go on to say this. He would say that when I came to you, I came to you not in eloquent speech or in deep teaching, for I purposed in my heart to only know this, Christ and Him crucified. How many are hearing this? Because he said that is where the power of God is. Now, how many are hearing what the Lord is saying? Because Paul understood this. He said this. He said, I preach Christ and Him crucified because that is where the power of God is. Now we need to understand this. Paul could write letters to the churches that we consider canon today. Paul was caught up into the third heaven and he heard things that words could not express. How many know he could have walked into those towns where he was going to birth a church and start talking about heavenly revelation that would blow people away? Yeah. He could go in as a Pharisee and talk Jewish law yeah. in a way that would blow people away. But what did he say? I preach Christ and Him crucified for the gospel of Christ is power! Hallelujah. <laughs> See, he knew there was power in the shed blood of Jesus. Yeah. That was the gospel. So what has the enemy tried to do in the church today? Do you know there's entire denominations that have written the songs out of their hymnal that say anything about the blood? Yeah. Entire denominations. Witness. I don't think you heard me. When Christ crucified, shed blood of Calvary, is preached in the church, the Holy Spirit shows up to bear witness. Yeah. How does Holy Spirit bear witness? Signs, wonders, miracle, power, anointing, deliverance, healings, restorations. Glory. Why does the church today, many have a form of godliness that denies the power thereof? Because the blood isn't preached on anymore. Right. Because the crucifixion isn't preached much anymore. I read about a guy who's a very well-known prophetic author, anointed man of God, very large church out in California, very large 
corporate seeker church yeah. when movie stars go to yeah. big church a lot of money invited this guy out and he was going to speak three services this is true story in this church he shows up day one he's going to preach that night pastor pulls him into his office and says okay we're excited you're here but i don't want you to do any preaching on the blood that's offensive i don't want you to preach on the crucifixion people don't like to hear that stuff and don't you dare preach about alternate lifestyles because we're trying to fill the seats here and if i mentioned that church every single one of us would recognize it and we've read books from that church oh, yeah. it's not bethel by the way yeah. you know what he said to the pastor he said, sir, if I can't preach on the blood, if I can't preach the gospel, if I can't preach what the word says, then I'm not preaching in your church. Yeah. And he said, but we, we put this on Facebook. We put out flyers. There's people that are coming to hear you speak. He said, if I can't speak, if I can't preach Christ and him crucified, then I'm not going to preach. And he got in his car and he left. Oh, yeah. See, the enemy understands when we don't preach on the blood, we don't preach the crucifixion, we don't preach the Passover, we don't preach the truth of God, then the Holy Spirit doesn't show up to testify. Amen. See, the enemy understands that. He loves a powerless church because a powerless church is never going to come against him with the strategy of God and tear down the strongholds. Oh, how many are hearing what the Lord's saying? So if we want the power of God in this church, how many know we need to preach the blood? Yes. We need to preach Christ and Him yes. crucified. Yes. We need to seek the revelation of the cross. We need to preach who He is so the Holy Spirit will bear witness. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. We've got to preach Christ and Him crucified. But what is the seeker message? Well, the Lord just loves everybody. Yes. He's just love. That's yes. all He is, love. And he winks at your sin and everything's okay. Just come in. How many know that Paul said, I preach Christ and him crucified? And he said that lamb was picked out specially for a purpose. And he was crucified and his blood was shed. And he rose again on the third day. And I don't know about your Jesus, but my Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody comes to the Father but by me. And that's another move in the church. You know what? Let's just have all these multi-faith events because we're all on the same road anyway. Baloney. The Lord Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. Whenever I see that coexist bumper sticker, it makes me want to hurl yeah. because they take the cross of my Jesus and they put it with all these other religious symbols yeah. as if it belongs in that group when the cross is power. Yes. Not the wood itself, but what Jesus did, the yeah. finished work. Yeah. How many hear what the Lord is saying? Yeah. How many are enjoying the word today? Yeah. All right. We're, we're almost in the extra innings, so I want to give you four things as we begin to wrap up today. Hallelujah. What are four things that God wants to take wants us to take away today from this teaching on the Passover and on the cross? And I believe these are lining up right now with powerful things that God is beginning to do in this body. Number one, the Lord wants us to understand that this message of the Passover, it's a message of new beginnings. See, we've got to understand this because Israel had been in Egypt for 430 years. How do they know that by the time Moses came along, they had no idea who Jehovah was anymore? Yeah. Right. They were that far removed. See, you know what happened right after Joseph died? The word says a Pharaoh was raised up who didn't know Joseph. Yeah. Yes. And things began to change very quickly. We need to understand this. Right now, we've got a Pharaoh in the land. And he doesn't know Joseph. We need to pray for our president. That that man gets radically saved. We need to pray for our vice president. Because I tell you what, God is getting fed up with some things that are going on. Yes, he is. And let's pray that they repent and get saved. Because if they don't, there are some things that are about to happen. But how many know we're covered as God's people? Amen. But we are to pray for those in positions of authority. The word says that. Can I hear an amen? amen? So we've got to understand something. When Moses stood at the burning bush before the Lord, and he said, Lord, who am I going to say sent me? 
He wasn't being he wasn't being facetious. He knew that Israel didn't know who he was anymore. Who am I going to say sent me? He's literally saying that. And we see in most of our translations that he said, I am that I am. That's not the truest translation in Hebrew. The truest translation is this, I will be whom I will be. How many know that's different? Because when the Lord said, I will be whom I will be, the Lord is saying, I will be everything that Israel needs me to be. I will be savior, healer, deliverer. I will be provider. I will be protector. I will be everything that they need me to be. And the Lord is here to say to this group today, he will be whom he will be. And it's for a season of new beginnings. Yeah. And we need to understand this in the Lord. See, the, the, the Passover is prophetic. It was the beginning of a new month. It was the beginning of a new season. It was the beginning of a new time. It was the Hebrew number eight. And the Lord is saying, I am bringing my church into a new beginning. Hallelujah. I'm bringing my people into a new beginning. How many are hearing what the Lord says? Hallelujah. This is important. Woo, hallelujah. But here's the thing. How many know that if you study the Hebrew and you start looking at the Jewish culture and the major covenants of the Jewish culture, one of the most unique was the blood covenant. And the blood covenant many times was established because there was a farmer or there was someone who owned flocks that had no way to protect them and an army would show up who had no source for food and whoever owned the land and the crops and the, and the animals would make a covenant with the soldiers that would protect them. Yeah. And many times they'd make a blood covenant. There was a shedding of blood in these covenants. And in Israel, whenever there was a blood covenant, the covenant was for life. And when they made a blood covenant, they basically stated this covenant can only be broken if the, one of the covenant partners dies... Or if it's broken outside of that, the one who breaks it will die, will be killed. The interesting thing is when you study the blood covenant in the Old Testament, it was the only covenant that had to be renewed daily. Amen. Which means what? As new covenant people that God is bringing us in the new beginnings, we need to go to the cross daily. Yeah. Going to the cross didn't only happen the night that you were saved. We need to go to the cross daily. We need to be covered in the blood daily. Amen. We need to die daily. That's something we forget about Christianity. We need to go to the cross every single day. At the cross, we find forgiveness. And how do they know this? Forgiveness gives us back our future. Yes. Hallelujah. That's why one of the things the enemy tries to use to hold us back from our destiny is unforgiveness. Amen. Unforgiveness robs us of our destiny. But if we go to the cross every day, we receive forgiveness from the Lord. And Holy Spirit begins to convict us of our own unforgiveness. Yes. So we begin to release that yes. at the foot of the cross. Amen. Can I hear an amen? amen? Secondly, the Lord says this. He wants us to understand from the Passover Hallelujah, that Jesus was the sinless, perfect sacrifice. So we've got to understand this, guys. Jesus did for us what only he could do. Is anybody hearing this? Mm -hmm. Now, how many have a room for a little more revelation here yes. in this time together today? Yes. So we, we've got to understand this. And Pastor Sidney, can can you give us first can you give us John chapter one and verse twenty nine? It's interesting in Exodus 12, 5, the word says that when they selected a lamb, it was to be without spot and without blemish. And how many know that was a prophetic picture of the fact that the Lord Jesus was going to be without spot and without blemish? Sinless. How many received that? So we've got to understand, if we were in, in Bible school right now, they would teach us when Jesus came, he was the hypostatic union. He was part God and part man. That's what he was. But how many know he had a human side? Yes. 
Yes. And that human side could ascend. Yeah. That's why Paul said in Hebrew, we have a great high priest who understands what we go through because he too was tempted in every way, yet remained sinless. Yes. That means when we're saved, we can become like our high priest. Are we ever going to be sinless? Well, I don't know about that, but we're going to learn to sin less. Yeah. How many are catching this? And every day we're going to the cross and we're becoming more like him. Jesus was the Father's hand-picked spotless lamb. Israel would go out to their flock and pick the best lamb. When it was time for a lamb to be slain for the sins of the world, the Father took his most precious relationship. The lamb that was at the throne next to him. See, we've got to understand that somewhere in eternity past, Jesus looked to the Father and said, Father, I'm lonely. I want a bride. And the Father looked at Jesus and said, Son, I'm lonely. I want a family. And we were conceived in the mind of God. And the Father said to the Son, Son, you know what's going to happen. They're going to, they're going to sin and they're going to need a Savior. And Jesus said, Father, I'm willing. At that very moment, he became the lamb that was slain. In the mind of the Father, it was done the moment Jesus agreed. Things happen in heaven differently than what we realize. That's why he already shed his blood. Because to the Father, it was already done. Why could he walk in authority? It was already done in the eyes of the Father. Why could he heal the sick, raise the dead, and cast out demons? It was already done in the eyes of the Father. So we've got to catch this. Now, if we really want to get serious, there's some things in your life that are already done in the eyes of the Father. You've just got to come into agreement with them and step into these things. You are much more powerful in the realm of the Spirit than you realize. See, in the realm of the Spirit, Father sees the completed work through the blood. We've got to come into agreement with that and in alignment with that. You start looking at the Wigglesworth and the Coleman's and all these other people, they began to see themselves the way God sees them and they began to walk that way. Yeah. Yeah. I am complete in Him who is the completion of all things. Yeah. As He is, so are we in this world. We've got to get our mindset in the right place. Now I want you to notice something. John 1, 29. The Word says, Then one day John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God. Notice the wording here. My NIV translation of the Bible doesn't say, look the Lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world. My Bible says the Lamb of God who takes away, present tense, already happening. How could he take away the sins of the world if he hadn't shed his blood yet? Yeah. Because in the eyes of the Father, it was already done. Mm -hmm. Revelation 13, 8. Jesus is the Lamb slain from the foundations of the world. Hallelujah. Praise God. Guys, I'm going to say this to the Father. Before Jesus ever said, let there be light, the blood was shed in his eyes. It was done. When Jesus went to the cross was crucified, died, and rose again. He said, it is finished, right? Yeah. Really, when Jesus said it was finished, he said this, I've accomplished my goal. Bride, come forth. See, we've got to understand this. He had to come and shed his blood to fulfill the scripture. That's why Jesus over and over again in his earthly ministry said, this must be done to fulfill the scripture. It still had to be done. But in the eyes of the Father, it was already done. Jesus just put the exclamation point on it through his obedience. That's why John was able to look at him and he saw the finished work already when he looked at Jesus. He was prophetic. David saw the finished work. Abraham saw the finished work. Abraham longed to see him. He saw him, the word says. When did he see him? When he was on the mountain ready to sacrifice Isaac and he was going to plunge the knife and the Spirit of God said, don't do it, Abraham. He looked over and saw a ram in the thicket. That ram in the thicket, he looked over it. He saw Calvary and he said, you are Jehovah Jireh. You're the God who provides. I believe Abraham 
looked through the ram caught in the thicket and he saw Calvary and he saw Jesus crucified. Hallelujah. And then he said, you are Jehovah Jireh. He was rich, wealthy, and he had flocks and herds. One little ram wasn't going to do anything. He saw the cross and the blood and he said, you're the God who provides. In that very moment, he realized Jesus was going to shed his blood for all his descendants who would be like the, the grains of sand on the seashore. Yes. See, our God doesn't just prophesy it. He fulfills it. Yes. See, we've got to understand that. And he makes a way when there is no way. So John looks at him and says, this is the Lamb who takes away the sins of the world. Present tense. He's doing it right now. That's why Jesus was able to look at people and say, you're forgiven. And the religious people went nuts. What? How, who does he have authority? The Father gave it to him because it was already done in the eyes of the Father. How's that apply to you? He already sees the finished work of your life. He already sees you stepping into your destiny. And just as I mentioned a moment ago, you didn't get saved because one day you decided you needed the Savior. You agreed with His choosing. Now we need to agree with His calling, His destiny, what He wants to do in our lives. See, part of dying is coming into agreement with Him. It's coming out of agreement with your flesh and what you want and coming into agreement with what he wants for you. Amen. See, Uncle Pat, he already sees the finished work when he sees you. And sometimes God allows me to see who people are in the realm of the Spirit. That very first Sunday you were here, I saw you sitting over there and I went, whoa. I can see what God's going to do in that man's life. Uncle Pat, you didn't just come here because you were invited. God brought you here. And God's going to use you powerfully in your family. And God says the latter glory is going to be so much greater than the former glory of your life. He says life up to this point has not ended up the way you thought it would. But the Lord said it's going to end really well. He says you're going to finish the race. You're going to run, you're going to run the race. You're going to finish the day. And it's going to be amazing. To him. And the Lord says he saves the best line for last. Yes. And he says, everything behind you is covered in the blood. The beginning, not the tail. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. People haven't understood you, but that's okay. Jesus understood you from the moment. You also got to understand, this is God's people. When they put the blood on the doorpost, death had to pass over. But yet the word says it's appointed for man once to die. And then judgment. See, so we've got to understand this. When we're covered in the blood, the spirit of death has to pass over us. Yeah. But we're still called to die. Yeah. I'm crucified with Christ. Yeah. Right. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I live, but Christ who liveth in me. Yes. Right. See, we face death here on earth as God's people. Those that reject him face death for all of eternity. Yeah. It's appointed for a man once to die. And then judgments. Can I hear an amen? Amen. All right. We've also got to realize, and this is the third thing. I'm going to give you four all together. We've got to realize that when Jesus died on the cross, he died not only for the world, but he died for each and every one of us individually. And he died for our families too. What do I mean by that? It's real easy to say Jesus died to take away the sins of the world. John said it, right? The lamb that takes away the sin of the world. But he's a God who wants you to know him intimately. Yeah. And he wants you to know that even if you were the only one walking the earth, he would have shed his blood so that you could be saved. He's a personal God and he loves you. He knows every intimate detail of, his, of your life and he wants to bless you. Can I hear an amen? amen? He wants to bring change to your life. He loves you so much that he doesn't want you to remain the way that he found you. Can I hear an amen? amen. How many received that? Yes. Amen. amen. He wants us to understand that. Okay? And then he wants us to understand, number four, that when we eat of Jesus as the Passover lamb, there are instantaneous effects and manifestations of God that take place when we begin to take Jesus into us. 
How many know the word of God says this? Christ in you is the hope of glory. And we've got to understand when we receive Jesus as Savior, his blood covers us. And his blood begins to go to work. That's why Paul said, for those who are in Christ Jesus, they are a new creation. The old things have passed away and all things have become new. Now, I got to tell you something. I got to tell on myself here real quick. God really did something very quietly in me yesterday. Somebody had sent me something that, that I had read that where somebody was talking about their past and things that they had been through and how God took them through those things. And it really, really ministered to me when I read it. Really, really ministered to me. Someone sent me an excerpt of some things Catherine Coleman had gone through. And, you know, think what you may have heard. God used this lady in a powerful, yes. powerful, powerful way. Yes. And birthed a lot of ministry through her ministry. And it's interesting because she had a powerful ministry. And then she kind of got into some trouble. Yeah. She kind of got a little wayward in some things. And she was out of ministry for eight years. And they said during that time, because she married somebody and he was an evangelist, that he would go out with her and he would preach evangelistic meetings, but she would be up on the stage while he preached and she'd just be weeping the entire time. Because when she stepped into some things, God took her ministry away from her. For eight years, eight, the Hebrew number of new beginnings. At the end of that eight years, she repented and she walked away from the things that she had stepped into. And God brought her back into ministry. And the glory that was on the latter portion of her ministry mm -hmm. was greater and eclipsed the glory in the previous part of her ministry. Mm -hmm. But she said she knew the very moment she let go of that previous season. She said it was a Saturday afternoon. I was in prayer before the Lord. She said that Saturday afternoon at 4 p.m., Catherine Coleman died. Mm -hmm. She said at that point, I let go of what I'd been holding on to. And she said, I died and Jesus came forth in me. Mm -hmm. And they said after that point in her ministry, she'd just be walking down the street and people would go out all around her. They'd go out in the spirit. She'd walk into a room and people would just go out. She walked in the manifest power and presence of God. Now, she had a pretty major discombobulation if you study this thing that she went through. It was very major. But how many know the blood of Jesus washes away our sin? The Word says when we confess our sin, He's faithful and He's just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And it was like when I read that, there were some things in my past that I was still struggling with the fact that they went on, you know? And it's like, that just blessed me because I got on my face before the Lord and I said, Lord, I just want to die so that you can live. Mm -hmm. And I felt Jesus snap a plumb line behind me. And I felt like the Lord said, Andrew, now all those things are behind you and they're covered in the blood. Now we're going to move forward together like never before. Oh, yeah. Last night, you know, this morning I just got up with a spring in my step, mm -hmm. spent time with the Lord. I, I went in the bathroom to shower and I turned on, opened the scrolls, break the seals, worthy one. And I'm just in the bathroom shower and getting ready and we're opening scrolls and I'm dancing in the shower before the Lord. That had to look strange in the realm of the Spirit. But I'm dancing before the Lord and I'm drying off and getting ready to come out of the shower, you know, in my jammies. And, and uh, all of a sudden they get to that point, open the scrolls, break the seals, worthy one. And that's usually where I find the nearest wall. Amen. Like today and start banging on that wall, right? You know, and, and I caught myself at the bathroom door thinking, I gotta I gotta hammer on this wall. But then I thought, well maybe I shouldn't. So I walk out the bathroom door and there's Holly, she's smiling, she goes, I thought you were gonna bang on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> and I said I felt like it. But I wanted to do it because I had so much joy. Because I felt like God just lifted some weights off me. And the enemy had been accusing in some areas that were already covered in the blood. Sure. But God wanted to bring me to a deeper place of surrender. Yeah. And I think part of dying in the Lord so that we might live, or he might live through us, 
That's something that God takes us to periodically. Mm -hmm. That place of dying, you don't just do it once. It's not one die fits all. It's we kind of die daily. And the Lord just keeps taking us back to the cross. But see, here's the thing. God started speaking to me a few months back. He said, forget the past. Let go of what lies behind. For behold, I'm doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? Guys, that's for every single one of us today. How many receive that? God's doing a new thing. And the amazing thing is, he says in Hebrews 12, 24, he says, my blood speaks a better word than Abel. And I keep hearing the Holy Spirit say that also. Andrew, my blood speaks a better word. And it speaks a better word for you in front of the Father. My blood is always speaking. You know, the interesting thing is Cain kills Abel. And the Lord shows up and says, Cain, what have you done? He said, what are you talking about? Where's your brother? Am I my brother's keeper? He said, did I not know that you slew your brother and even now his blood cries out? Hearing this? That's why Paul was a murderer, but he was able to say it's covered in the blood. Because he confessed it and received God's call on his life. In fact, he said, I'm the least of the disciples because I held the coats of those that were stoning Stephen. But yet he realized the blood covered and he could be an apostle despite the things that he had walked in. How many are hearing this? Why is that? Because as God's people were covered in the blood. Can I hear an amen? Yeah. See, we've got to understand that. And I want to close by getting us just to think about this real quick. You know, it's interesting during Passover, they take the blood and the hyssop and they put it on the doorposts. They cover the doorposts in the blood. And the Lord said, cover the doorposts in, your, in the blood because then when I pass by, the angel of death will not visit your house. How many know the enemy can't touch where the blood is applied? Okay. But we need to understand this. They put the blood on the house. When we're looking at dreams and visions, and many times in the word, when you see the word house, it's not always talking about a physical house that we may live in. Your house is also your ministry. Your house can be this, can be the house. Your house can be the your family. How many are hearing this? Your life. We've got to realize because of the spotless lamb that was sacrificed and the blood that was shed, the blood is applied to us at salvation. And the house is covered. And the Lord wants us to know this day, I've covered your house in the blood. I've covered you. I've covered your family. I've covered this church. I've covered your ministry. I've covered everything. My, your finances, your needs, your job, your vehicle. I have covered them in my blood. And there's protection there. But we need to apply that blood daily. Every morning when I get up, I, I plead the blood of Jesus yes. over every single one of you. Every single morning. Why? Because the blood covenant in the Hebrew culture had to be renewed daily. We've got to go to the cross daily. In the wilderness, they had to collect manna daily. David said, Lord, early in the morning do I seek you. Daily. I apply that blood every day. Does it wash off? No, but I keep applying the blood. Amen. Amen. I want the enemy to know that we know that we've got the blood. Amen. And there's power in the blood. Yes. Amen. There's power in the gospel. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So the Lord says that we're covered in his blood. But church, we now need to come into agreement with his blood. Amen. Now grab a hold of this. The blood speaks a better word. What is the blood speaking? We've got to come into agreement with what the blood is speaking. What is the blood of Jesus speaking over you? You're saved. You're healed. You're whole. You're restored. You're delivered. You're a person of destiny. I have a mighty call on your life. 
What do we need to do? Come into agreement with what the blood is saying. Everything is established on the testimony of two witnesses. The blood speaks and you come into agreement with what the blood is speaking. Now, I want to say this, guys. Some of us are not walking in what God says we're supposed to walk in because you haven't come into agreement with what the Lord is speaking over your life. Amos 3.3, 3, how can two walk together unless they agree? And the Lord says, I want you to come into agreement with what I'm speaking over your life. There will be people that stand before him on that day that were, they're saved, but never truly came into agreement with what he's spoken over their life. They're saved. They knew him, but they never really surrendered to what he had for them. They, they walked in some of it, but they never really, really caught what it truly was that they had for him. And guys, I'm telling you, if you're going to come into agreement with the blood that speaks a better word, you're going to die in the process. Because when you come into agreement with him, you're coming out of agreement with yourself. Mm -hmm. When you come in agreement with what he has for you, you're coming out of agreement with everything that you wanted. Mm -hmm. But you know in him, everything you ever wanted, you're really going to find in him. Yes. It's the call to die. For me to live as Christ and to die is... Isn't it interesting that the Lord made the very first feast Passover? The Lord Jesus fulfills that feast when he comes into Jerusalem the very last week of his life. But we're going to see the greatest fulfillment of the Passover at the end of the age. When the one who shed his blood comes to rule and reign on the earth in the millennial reign. That's going to be the greatest fulfillment. Guys, he saves the best wine for last. And I want to encourage you right now to come into agreement with Jesus on everything he has for your life. Yes. Now, you may never have thought to yourself, you know, Jesus just spoke this and I don't agree with it. You may never have thought that. But what happens is he speaks and we just ignore because we don't like what we're hearing. Or he speaks and we just don't act like we heard it because we don't like what he's speaking. Or he speaks and we hear it and so we kind of withdrawal from him a little bit. Okay, I'm going to say this in love. Okay? There are people in this body that I have seen God really touch you and really begin to do something in your life. And things begin to move until you get to the point of unsurrender. And when you get to that point where you are come, on, come out of agreement with him, that's when that progress stops. And what I see you do then is kind of then just distance yourself from him a little bit at that point. And when you do that, you lose valuable time. And we don't have time anymore to do that. See, the Lord Jesus will take you right up to the point where you don't agree with him any longer and you'll stop right there. And you won't progress past that point until you get before him and go, Lord Jesus, I just repent. I've hit a wall. And that wall is called lack of surrender. And Lord, this time when we hit this wall, I'm not going to distance myself from you. I'm going to stand at that wall with you, put my hands up in surrender, and I want you to take my hands and yours and let's pull those bricks down together. Mm -hmm. That to him. I mean, agreement's wonderful until you get to the point where you're not in agreement with him. And guys, submission to Jesus doesn't start when you're in agreement with him. It starts when you're in disagreement and you humble yourself and you agree with them in that place. Mm -hmm. And there are some people in this room and God deals with me on this one daily, guys. There's some of us in this room that God will touch us and we'll get to that wall and then back away. And he'll touch us again, we'll get to that wall and we'll 
back away. And we'll, he'll touch us again, we'll get to that wall, and we'll back away. Mm -hmm. The Lord says something very interesting in obscure, in obscure scripture in the Old Testament. He says, your walls are ever before me. Mm -hmm. And he isn't just talking about Jerusalem. He's talking about our walls. So I just want to encourage you as we're talking about the Passover to think about this. How many know when Jesus went to Calvary, he went in complete submission to the Father? Yes. Everything that needed to be done, he did it. Everything that needed to be done, he did it. And he knew it had to be done exactly the Father's way. So when it was done, he could say, it is finished. The Lord wants to bring us to a place where we're willing to do everything the way he wants it done. If we don't come to a place where we go from agreement to coming out of agreement with him because we don't like what it is that he's asking us to do or to be or to surrender or to let go of. I want to say it again. The Lord was saying to me last week in service, Sunday morning service, that there's some of us right now that are dictating our schedule to God. And we're kind of dictating what we're going to do and what we're not going to do. Mm. The Lord says, you're not going to see my destiny that I promised you pour forth in your life until you come into agreement with me. Mm -hmm. And the Lord says, once we come into agreement, I'm going to set your schedule. Mm -hmm. I'm going to let you know what you're going to do and not do. Yeah. <clears throat> The guy's submission is no problem when we realize the one we're submitting to really loves us and has our best interests in mind. Mm -hmm. Some of the greatest failures in my life is because I came out of God on agreement with something and I did it my way. I came out of agreement with him and I did it my way. Guess what happened every single time? Disaster. But I've come to realize in the points in my life where I stayed in agreement with him even though I disagreed, yeah. Those have been some of the greatest victories in my life. And the Lord comes to me periodically and says, Andrew, there's a whole lot of Andrew left. And I just have to cry out to him, Lord, all of you and none of me. All of you and none of me. All of you and none of me. And he said, Andrew, the times where the enemy has really come in and waylaid you, it's because you came out of agreement with me. He says, Andrew, there's protection in agreement. There's protection in agreement. And the enemy has had some access to some of our lives because there's been holes that he's been able to come through. And those holes and the gaps in the walls are because that's the place where we're not in agreement with the Lord. And the enemy flourishes where we're not in agreement with God. The enemy can't get in where we are. And so I just want to encourage you as we're talking about the sacrifice that Jesus made today. His blood that was shed and the fact that he laid it all on the line for us. I want us to think about the fact that right now he's wanting us to come into agreement with him. And really become who he created us to be. So we're going to do this. The lights are going to go out. And we're just going to take a couple minutes in the presence of the Lord. And you know, I could say, you know, let's pray this prayer. Repeat this after me. The Lord Jesus, right now I just surrender to you. You can repeat a prayer after me. But how many know you can repeat a prayer and not mean it? Right? Or you can repeat a prayer and kind of mean it. I want to encourage you right now. Just get before the Lord in these next couple minutes. Ask him, Lord, is there anywhere in my life where we're not in agreement? Your blood speaks a better word. What's your blood speaking over me? And where am I not in agreement with what your blood is speaking? Lord Jesus, you wrote things about me in the book that you wrote about my life. Lord, where have I come out of agreement with what you've written about my life? Lord, where did I start reading and I didn't like the paragraph, so I just stopped reading? Lord, where, where are those places or where is that place? And guys, I want to encourage you. If the Holy Spirit says, well, this, this is where it is. This is that place. Surrender to the Lord right there. 
Get on your knees at that wall and just say, okay, Lord, my walls are ever before you. I surrender that wall to you. I come into agreement with you. As you do that, I want to encourage you to prepare your heart for communion. Perfect time. Perfect road to travel to get ready for communion. I want to encourage you as you're talking to the Lord about a place where maybe you came up agreement with them. And you're surrendering to him. So Andrew, there's some steps of faith I want you to take. I wanted you to take him in a previous season and you didn't, you didn't agree with me on that step of faith. So I'm bringing it around again. You're back in the same classroom and in the same seat and I'm passing out the test. Are you going to give me the right answer this time? So you can pass the class and move into the next dimension of what I have for you. Part of the reason why I had a spring in my step this morning was because I not only knew that God put some things behind me under the blood, but I also knew that I came into agreement with him on some areas where we were kind of arm wrestling a little bit. I didn't purposely do it, but I did it. And the Lord not just said, the Lord and I had to come to that place. So the Lord's saying many of us feel the tension that we're supposed to go into the next season, but we feel stuck. The Lord says some of it is his timing. Some of it is you need to come into agreement with him if you're going to get to the next season. The Lord, some of, Lord says, some of it's my timing. It's me. It's going to happen, but it's my timing. The Lord says, for some of us, it's because you're not coming into agreement with me on something I want you to do. How can you walk together in this day, right? The revelation's awaiting an appointed time. Lord, your time and not ours. I just speak a release and an anointing in this room right now for surrender. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would move in this room right now with the sweet anointing of surrender to Jesus. Holy Spirit, I thank you. That's the sweetest fragrance there is <coughs> this side of eternity is the fragrance of surrender to you, Lord. I thank you, Lord Jesus. Surrender leads to obedience. And obedience leads to breakthrough. So, Lord Jesus, I ask that you would release through the power of the Holy Spirit an anointing of surrender. You know, in the Baptist church, there seems to be a lot of those old hymns coming up today. We used to sing, I surrender all. I surrender all. All to me, my Precious Savior, I surrender all. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to my precious Savior, I surrender all. Hmm. I surrender all. We give it all to you, Lord Jesus. 
I surrender all, all to Thee, my precious Savior, I surrender all. So Lord Jesus, in the sovereign moment, we surrender. And Lord Jesus, as we're about to take communion, Lord, we just acknowledge right now that we can never take communion unless you surrendered for our sake. Your surrender is the reason why there's bread and there's a cup on the table. It's because your precious body was broken for our sake. It's because your precious blood was shed for our sake. Lord Jesus, your surrender is the reason why we can commune with you. So Lord Jesus, I just ask right now that you would touch every person in this place that's about to take communion. Lord, we take communion once a month, but we're to commune with you every day. And Lord, I ask as we take communion today, if there's any generational strongholds, if there's anything holding anyone back in this room, if there's any curse, that's standing in the way and speaking a word. Lord, I, Lord Jesus, I declare your blood is speaking a better word. And Lord Jesus, I ask that your blood would remove the strongholds, the curses, the roadblocks that would hold anyone in this room back from having an intimacy with you, Lord Jesus, that transforms their lives and through that transforms their generation. Lord, I thank you that D.L. Moody said just before he died, the world has yet to see what God can do through a person completely surrender to him. Lord Jesus, we want to be that person completely surrender to you. Lord, you said through Jim Elliot, he is no fool who gives that which he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. So, Lord, as we're about to take communion, Lord, as we partake of the bread, may we die in the process. Lord Jesus, as we drink of the cup, may we die in the process. Lord Jesus, right now, corporately as a body, we come into agreement with you. We come into the courtroom of the third heaven, the courtroom of agreement. And Lord Jesus, as the Refuge Ministry Center International, we come into agreement with you for the destiny of this house. Lord Jesus, individually, we come into agreement with you for the, your destiny in our lives. And we come out of agreement with the sins, the transgressions, and the iniquities of our ancestors that said no to you. Lord Jesus, right now, and you guys can agree with me on this if you choose to. Lord Jesus, right now, we just come out of agreement with our ancestors. And even the churches in this region that were stubborn, self-willed, refused to die, wanted to live their own lives. Lord, we're just resistant to you. Stephen said to those that were about to stone him, and you will always resist the Holy Spirit and stubbornness. Lord, we repent for the stubbornness and the resistance of the Holy Spirit in our family lines. Lord Jesus, and in the churches in this region because we're a part of the church. Lord, we repent for sin falling short. Lord, we repent for transgression, stepping across lines that you said don't step across. Lord, we repent for iniquity, witchcraft allowed in the family line through rebellion and other things that now has tried to rob us of our destiny in this last generation. Lord Jesus, we come out of agreement with those things right now through your blood. And Lord Jesus, we come into agreement with you. And we love you, Lord Jesus. Lord, we come out of agreement with stubbornness and rebellion and pride. And we come into agreement with you and humble ourselves. Lord Jesus, in Philippians 2, the word says, you humbled yourself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. 
Therefore, God the Father exalted you and gave you a name that's above every name. That the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that you are Lord, Lord Jesus. You are Adonai to the glory of God the Father. Lord Jesus, this day we come into agreement with you. We humble ourselves and become obedient to death. Anyone who agrees with that, just say, Kien. Kien. That's yes in Hebrew, Kien. And Lord, your blood transforms, and we are covered in the blood of the Passover lamb, the lamb slain before the foundations of the world, Revelation 13, 8. You, Lord Jesus. Lord, I ask now, may a transforming anointing come over each and every one of us. May doors close that need to close, and may doors <coughs> open that need to open. And Lord, reveal to us the treasures in the darkness. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that Paul didn't get all the mysteries. The greatest mysteries that you desire to reveal are at the end of the age. From your word, in alignment with your word. Lord Jesus, now I pray that you would bless this communion that we're about to take. Lord, this is not a once a month ritual. This is a time of encounter with you. Lord Jesus, may your blood, or may your may the bread that represents your broken body bring healing. Lord, I thank you only came next to me during prayer, during worship, and he said to me, Pastor Andrew, the Lord says, I am healing. Yes, you are, Lord Jesus. You are healing. And Lord Jesus, I ask as we drink of the cup, may you release deliverance over us. And Lord, I decree and declare over this house a new season. We're forgetting the past. We're letting go of what lies behind. We're discerning what you're doing. You're making streams in the deserts and rivers in the wasteland. Lord Jesus, right now we say key in to this new season in everything that you have for us in it. Say that with me, church. Kian. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Woo. Let's stand. Hallelujah. Let's stand before the Lord. How many are ready to take communion today? Yeah. I'm telling you guys, the Lord wants us to expect things to be different after this service. He wants us to expect things to be different. I don't know if you heard me yet. He wants us to expect things to be different. There was a shifting in this service today. There was a shifting in your life. I want you to expect things to be different, but as the different begins to manifest, don't resist. Just say, yes, Lord. Sometimes we can cry out for change, but then when he brings it, we're like, whoa, wait a minute here. Hold on. See, we can't surrender and then dictate how the Lord brings the change. We've just got to say, yes, Lord. As Holly and I prayed over Kim yesterday, she looked at me and she said, I felt a shift in as we begin to pray. Whoa, that's a great word. Shift, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Amen. Hallelujah. So I'm going to ask this group to come over in the center aisle, please. Please come down the altar and take a piece of bread and a cup. Return down the middle aisle to your area, please. And we'll partake together. I surrender I surrender all, all to Thee, my precious Savior. I surrender all. Hallelujah. I surrender. I surrender all, all to Thee, my precious Savior, I 
surrender all. I surrender all. I surrender Savior. I surrender Hora da shira va kindi va shora va ki Hora va kindiya va shira va ki Hora va va kindi va 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 Hora va shira va kudra va hamia Hora va shira va kudra va hamia In the name of Jesus, I just declare breakthrough over you. Breakthrough! 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 In the name of Jesus, right now, I declare God is bringing breakthrough in your life like never before. I speak breakthrough over you. I speak breakthrough over your family. Breakthrough! 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 In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, in your name I speak breakthrough over Brother Scott right now. Lord Jesus, you are healing. And I speak breakthrough over his kidneys right now. I speak breakthrough over his heart right now. Breakthrough over his lungs right now. I speak breakthrough in the name of Jesus. Breakthrough in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. How many receive breakthrough right now? On the count of three, let's shout breakthrough. One, two, three. Breakthrough. Hallelujah. Probably not normal to do that during communion, but that's okay. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're not interested in normal, are we, refuge? <laughs> Hallelujah. How many know the word says that we believe in our heart, but we confess with our mouth? Amen. So please hold the bread up in front of you right now and just wave it before the Lord. Wave it before the Lord. And just say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for your body that was broken for my sake. This day, I receive everything that your broken body purchased for me, for my family, for my generation, for this region. And for Israel, I come into agreement, Lord Jesus, right now, I agree with you for everything that you have for my life. Amen. Church, the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took the bread and he said, this bread represents my body which will be broken for your sake. He took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this do in remembrance of me. Let us partake. Hallelujah. Let's hold the cup up before the Lord and just say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for your precious blood that was shed for my sake. This day I receive 
everything that your precious blood purchased for me, for my family, for my generation, for this region, and for Israel. I come into agreement with what your blood is speaking over my life this day. Lord Jesus, for your blood speaks a better word. Amen. Lord Jesus, we just bless your name right now. Thank you for your shed blood. Church, the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took the cup. And he said, this cup represents my blood, which will be shed for your sake. And then one of the, God, one of the authors of the Gospels went on to say that he also said, and I will not partake of the fruit of the vine again until we're all together. Bo Yeshua Bo. Say that with me, church. Bo Yeshua Bo. Come, Lord Jesus, come. He said, this do in remembrance of me. Let us partake. Ooh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord, we love you, Lord, we love you, Lord, we love you, Lord, we love you. 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 Oh, yes, you. Jesus, we just thank you for this beautiful time we've had in your presence today. Lord, you said one comes with a song, one a hymn, one a spiritual song. Lord, I thank you that we've seen that in this house today. We've sung before you with music. We've sung a cappella. Your word has been spoken. Communion's been taken. Lord, we just enjoyed your presence today. Lord Jesus, I just say thank you for this time that you've given us today. 
And Lord, I thank you that moments like this on earth are a pale, a pale reflection of what it's going to be like to be together in eternity forever with you. Lord, I just believe we're going to be on the crystal sea singing together and we're going to look over and see each other and we're going to know. And Lord, we're going to see Abraham. We're going to see Daniel. We're going to see Wigglesworth. Lord, we're going to see people in our family that have known you in previous generations. Lord, I'm going to see my mom there on the crystal sea praising your name and worshiping you. Lord Jesus, we look forward to that day. Bo, Yeshua, Bo. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Lord Jesus, now I cover everything that you've done in this service in your blood. Lord, I cover everything that's happened today. And I decree and declare there's going to be no backlash, no retaliation, no counterattack of the enemy. Lord Jesus, I plead your blood over this week. And I decree and declare everyone in this house is going to see shiftings and new beginnings in their life all week long. Lord, it's going to continue in the next week, and the next week, and the next week. Lord Jesus, we're coming into Holy Week, Passion Week. We're there right now, Lord. Give us a greater passion for our first love. Lord, draw us nearer to your throne. And Holy Spirit, anoint us to fulfill the Lord's purpose in our generation. Lord Jesus, we come into agreement with you. Your blood speaks a better word. We come into agreement with you and we walk with you arm in arm, yoked with you from this point forward, you on the strong side of the oak and us in the weak side. And Lord, we pray these things now in your precious name. Lord, there's no other name under heaven given to men by which they can be saved but the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Were you blessed today? Amen. Woo! Yes. Hallelujah. So I'm going to ask Brother John to come forward, our resident Levite. And I'm going to ask him to dismiss us today with the blessing. Hallelujah. Everybody raise their hands for the blessing. Yes, Lord. First would be in Hebrew, and then I'll translate. Thank you, Lord. Ya Rekha Donai the Ishmareka. Ya Er Adonai Panavaleka the Hunaka. Isa Adonai Panavaleka the Assemblaka Shalom. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance towards you and fill you with peace. Nothing missing, nothing broken. May he bless your coming and going. May he bless you today from this service. May his words today bless you for eternity. In Jesus' name, Yeshua's name, amen. 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 Hallelujah. God bless you.